short prayer from the mother. Um, and, then I'll, and then I'll go over the, the procedure, the outline, how we're going to do the rest of the learning. So just, um, just get into a comfortable, alert position. And close your eyes or soften your gaze. And let's just take a few deep breaths and arrive. Let's just be here. Just feel the breath moving throughout your body. And into your quiet, I'm going to bring these words from the mother. It's from her, her journal. Uh, she wrote these words just before she met Sri Aurobindo, March 28, 1914. At no moment do I feel that I am living outside thee, and never have the horizons appeared vaster and the depths at once more luminous and unfathomable. Grant, O divine teacher, that we may know and accomplish our mission upon earth better and better, more and more that we may make full use of all the energies that are in us, and my sovereign presence become manifest ever more perfectly in the silent depths of our soul, in all our thoughts, all our feelings, all our actions. I find it almost strange to speak to you, since it is you who live in me who is thinking and loving. So just take a few more breaths. And when you're ready, open your eyes and be here. Well, it's really, what more can I say? Everybody can go home now. <laughs> <laughs> No, I can't. Is it you or there are some other Oh, there's a track. Um, I, I just want to yeah. Brenda, thank you for that really beautiful passage. I also want to thank uh, everybody for coming. Uh, Ishtar told me last week that everybody was going to come to, to celebrate me, but really I'm here to celebrate you because this place has is, is just been magical for me. Uh, an extraordinary experience that I, I wish wouldn't end in so many ways. I also want to um, express gratitude for my committee who have been extraordinarily patient with me for three years and um, I hope that uh, the product of our work together will um, uh, that you'll appreciate it. Get the light. Adrian comes and the light goes down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Jimmy, before you start, I mean, uh, before you start, I just want to say a couple of things. Okay, sure. um, I want to introduce our committee, uh, Jim Ryan, who is a core faculty member in philosophy and religion. It's great to have this wonderful work in here, Jim, and I especially want to welcome Hilary Anderson, who drove up here as usual from Los Angeles, so I don't know how you do it. Hilary is a very important part of the history of community and in particular of the East West Psychology Program. Hillary was one of the first core faculty members of the East West Psychology Program. She was academic dean of the Institute and I really, it's really wonderful to have you here and I want to welcome you as well. Um, and let me just say, can I have a light? Um, I just want to say how we're going to organize the day, the two hours. So Stephen, Okay. Yes. Ow. <laughs> 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 
Please turn off your devices. So uh, uh, Stefan is going to basically present his dissertation. Uh, it will be maybe 45 minutes uh, of the presentation from Stefan, and then uh, the committee will uh, follow up the presentation with comments and questions, and then we will invite comments and questions from the audience. Uh, that should take us to about 1.35. And then, um, I think we have to leave, Jim. I think that we'll just leave. There's too many people here. So we'll, okay. Can we do that? Can we, the three of us. So the committee will leave and adjourn, and we'll discuss in private um, the dissertation, and then return in about 20 minutes and announce the decision. Um, and you're all invited back for that. So that's the basic um, format for today. So, okay. So um, I guess the lights. Yeah, now we can have. <laughs> all right. Thank you. I jumped the gun a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. I'd also like to begin with a passage from Sri Aurobindo. The one whom we adore as the mother is the divine conscious force that dominates all existence, one and yet so many sided that to follow her movement is impossible, even for the quickest mind and for the freest and most vast intelligence. The title of the dissertation is Death and Transformation in the Yoga of Mira Alfasa, the mother of the Sri Aurobindo Ashram, a Jungian from Nudin. Um, my research problem was to explore the mother's visionary yoga um, of death and transformation. My thesis is that Jung's psychology and his technique of amplification can provide context for understanding the mother not always made explicit in her original teachings. I see Jung as a, a guide of the underlying mythological processes of the human psyche. His hermeneutic was comparative, uh, not focused on any one religion or system, epistemologically open and rooted in the symbol. According to Jung, the symbol manifests naturally when conflicting forces, ideas, and emotions, etc., are held psychologically in the tension of opposites. And he wrote that since the solution to the tension proceeds out of the confrontation and clash of opposites. It's usually an unfathomable mixture of conscious and unconscious factors, what you call the Tercian and the tour. And so the symbol is a type of a strange attractor that emerges from and is transparent to the psyche's uh, pre-systematic and pre-conceptual architecture. My hermeneutic had three components. The contextual, which was historical, biographical, and comparative. The interpretive, which is a mythological amplification of the symbols in the mother's work, and my heuristic practices, which remain mostly hidden, probably thankfully, in the dissertation. Uh, the primary texts that I worked from were the mother's agenda. This is 13 volumes of transcribed, recorded conversations that she had with one of her disciples over the final 23 years of her life, and also Sri Aurobindo's epic poem, Savitri. Six chapters. The bulk of the dissertation is in the central four, the mother and human context, a comparison of transformational structures, uh, death, and then finally death as transformation. And the significance, as I see it, is that it bridges east and west, as the mother herself bridged both east and west. It fills a gap in the literature. The mother is really under-researched in scholarship. And it exemplifies a guiding principle of CIIS, which is uh, scholarship as inner work, which I took very seriously. And it was a kind of a core assumption of uh, the, my writing that every conceptually and visually manifested landscape of our existence is a hermeneutical construction. Uh, I saw the dissertation as an alembic in which my own transformation was taking place during the research. So this brings us to the next chapter, which is the mother and human context. These are alchemical alembics, by the way. Um, I'm sorry, crucibles. I want to start with a quote from Marie-Louise von Franz uh, in her work for, on fairy tales, but I feel that this kind of really encapsulates my own experience during my research. Every mythical story is so much a unity and has such an integral form that, like a drop of water, it exhibits a kind of surface tension which becomes palpable for the would-be interpreter in the feeling that he or she is helpless in confronting something that is really infinitely simple and of one piece and that any interpretive grasping at a single image in the context would already destroy this perceived unity. And yet, the story is not comprehensible without amplification and interpretive tracing of the thread of the mythology. All, all 
although Sri Aurobindo and the mother saw themselves as one consciousness in two bodies, I argue that to see the mother only through that filter can sometimes obscure her unique genius. So I chose Jung to act as my guide because of his profound dedication to seeing beyond particular dogmas and religious structures to what he understood to be the symbolic substrate underlying all religions or religious assertions. But also because they spoke the same cultural language. Now Jung was born in 1875 in Kuznach, which is in Switzerland, right? and the mother three years later in Paris, France, they grew up 412 miles apart from one another. So what I argue in the dissertation is that they grew up within the same cultural container, a container that had some very powerful ideas um, that influenced both of them, and you can see it in their writings and their discussions, in uh, Darwinian evolution, experimental psychology, also in the field of occultism, the, the idea of the evolution of consciousness, mm -hmm. the secret occult tradition that supposedly you could trace back all the way into prehistory and unbroken lines. And the idea that became very central to the dissertation of crystallization, this is the path of the magus, the idea that the magus can crystallize their individual personality and it can survive from lifetime to lifetime, uh, therefore making them uh, immortal. Also in the humanities, if I can call it that, the tension between reason and faith, the waning influence of the church, also the rise of perennial philosophy and, and nascent globalism. This gentleman became kind of a minor obsession for me during the research and the writing of the dissertation. Max Theon, one of the unsung heroes of the occult movement of the 19th, late 19th century, he was the mother's first teacher and the co-founder of the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor. Um, in my research on him, and I started reading his writings, uh, and in looking at the, the other research that's been done on him, Theon, its influence on later Western occult teachings uh, absolutely cannot be overestimated. It's really a miracle that he's gone, uh, kind of flown under the radar for so many years. I wanted to look at the possible influence on, of Theon on integral yoga through the mother. Now the mother stated unequivocally at the end of her life, even at the end of her life, that Sri Aurobindo and the mother came to their ideas, which in many ways were identical, completely independently of one another, and she knew both of these men, so I have to honor that. Peter Hees said that any influence that may have uh, taken place was strictly terminological. But I want to point out that all of these ideas here were not present in Sri Aurobindo's work in, in this form until he met the mother, until after he met the mother. Um, what Sri Aurobindo himself said is that his, his ideas did not really take form until the mother came to him. And I look at this symbolically in that Sri Aurobindo was kind of taking the transcendent pole, and the mother represented very much the imminent pole. So the form would come through her. What I argue in the dissertation is that the form very much took the form of the teachings that she learned from Theon, and the mother remained a Western occultist through her entire life, and the way that she discussed her ideas in the agenda are very much rooted in her Western <coughs> occultism, as Sri Aurobindo's were in the Veda. I also wanted to look in this chapter at common concepts in integral yoga and analytic psychology. The mother and Jung used a lot of terms identical terms, but there were sometimes nuanced differences, and I felt that it was really important to unpack these. I won't go through them. Consciousness and the unconscious was one that was very important. So this brings me to the next chapter, which is on transformation, where I undertook a comparison of the two systems. I focused more on Sri Aurobindo here because he was more systematic uh, than the mother in discussing the transformative system. I begin with a quote from Answer to Job by Jung. All creation ex nihilo is God's and consists of nothing but God, with the result that man, like the rest of creation, is simply God become concrete. This has to do with this concept of libido, the energy of desire that pulses through the universe, <coughs> taking on manifest form. What Jung, and I would argue even Sri Aurobindo and the mother say, is that what God is is beyond the capacity of the mind, right? the, th the thinking mind, to comprehend. But we can experience it and see it in manifestation. The mother and Sri Aurobindo used the terminology involution and evolution to talk about the transformation of the manifest energy of the creator in creation. And Jung talk, spoke about the same thing in terms of ascent and descent, kind of mythologically. This is the psychological experience of God's descent into creation and the ascent or evolution of the human being as the carrier of consciousness. <coughs> now in integral yoga, the central symbol of this uh, whole transformative process is the psychic being. This is the eternal and evolving part of the human soul which manifests as light in the heart of each person. 
And then I turned to Sri Aurobindo's Sabatri, which was uh, originally a very short uh, story embedded in the, uh, the Indian epic, the Mahabharata. Savitri is the daughter of the sun, very important. She was born to the yogi Ashwapati for his austerities, and please forgive my pronunciation. Uh, Sachivan is Savitri's chosen husband, destined to die one year after they marry. And when Sachivan dies, Savitri follows him into the underworld and vies with the lord of death, who is Yama, for her husband's soul and wins it back. Sri Aurobindo saw Savitri as an allegory of the victory of love over death, and in his hands, he takes this very short tale and turns it, transforms it into a 700 place page epic, 700 plus page epic of the transformative journey of the soul of the earth, who is Satyavan, and the redemption of matter, which is done through the auspices of the Divine Mother. <coughs> now, I argue that Ash Ashwapati represents Sri Aurobindo and his yoga of ascent to the superconscious divine and return to the body, um, a journey that he undertakes twice, actually, in the story, and that's important. And I, I argue this because the mother herself states in numerous places in the agenda that Savitri represents her and her yoga of the descent into the inconscient and demonic and the, uh, the transformation of the body, which was really what her yoga was about. The central revelation, I argue, of Savitri among many, right, is that, the, that death is merely a mask or a veil of God, which obscures us from seeing that we all are the ground where the divine unity and the material multiplicity meet. Next, I turn to the idea of the triple transformation. So Sri Aurobindo wrote later in his life in poetic form, he wrote this into Savitri, but earlier in his philosophical writings, he writes about the triple transformation in a more schematic and abstract way. As soon as, soon as I started reading uh, about the, the triple transformation, I noticed immediately from my readings in Mysterium Conuxionis by Jung that this was uh, pretty much identical, or at least it's very similar to Gerhard Dorn, the alchemist Gerhard Dorn's threefold alchemical transformative system. Uh, Dorn himself was looking at a document from the first century Egypt, a kind of uh, alchemical hermetic Gnostic document that's called the Instruction of Cleopatra by the Archpriest Camarius, which talks about these transformations taking place in the symbolism of the Egyptian funerary uh, ritual, which I'll talk about later. And then I look at it in relation to these other um, areas, these, uh, these other forms, the Rosarium, which I'll talk about in a moment, Near Eastern mystical traditions, and so on. Simply put, the three stages are that the soul separates from the body and unifies with spirit, while the body lies dormant or undergoes transformation. Then the unified soul and spirit returns to and reunifies with the body. And that, then that's the enlightened being or the perfected individual. And then the soul-spirit body is then transformed one more time into a cosmic immortal being. This, under, uh, this is the unification of spirit and matter, what uh, Dorn and Jung called the Unus Mundus, what Sri Aurobindo called the, the supermental, and what uh, Theon himself called the corpus glorificationis, which is a uh, kind of chemical term that we find in the Rosarium, actually. The Rosarium are a set of 23 woodblock prints that illustrate the process of alchemical transformation in the alchemist. And it un undertakes this through contextual symbolism, which I think is really marvelous given the relationship of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. So the king and queen, the masculine and feminine principles, uh, join together in the hieros almost the sacred marriage, and then they transform through their conuptio into a hermaphrodite. This hermaphrodite that you see on the right then sinks down into water and then finally into a grave. And uh, uh, while it's in that grave, uh, there are two transformations that take place. The first is the male soul ascends to this kind of blue cloud that's lined with fire, where it undergoes a spiritual transformation and then returns. And then the female soul actually undergoes the same process, going up into the transcendent and then back down into the body of the hermaphrodite. When the two, uh, the two levels of this, the two stages are completed, what's formed is the rebus. I'll talk about the rebus in a moment. So you see here the motifs of ascent and descent. And there's also a threefold structure in that this separation and union, which takes place twice, then leads to universalization, which is the final step. And that takes place with the descent into matter. Now remember the mother, right, is descending into matter. So these first two I liken to Ashwapati's um, and Sri Aurobindo's yoga. And this last phase is the phase that I, that I uh, liken to the mother's. The rebus is this remarkable entity that's created uh, from the, the, the tension of opposites between the transcendent and the imminent and the male and the female. It's, Jung calls it a monstrum. It's a symbol of transcendental unity, but it's holding this unity 
uh, in, in this incredible tension. So there's a lot of energy that's pent up in it. And that's the dragon, and I'll talk about the serpent in a few moments. Um, this, Jung said, is the philosopher's stone. Once the, the philosopher's stone, which is the transformative substance, is created, then the next phase takes place. That's um, illustrated by the green lion devouring the sun. Adam McLean, the alchemical scholar, says that this is Christ's descent. It represents Christ's descent into death, into the underworld. And you can see that with the sun here that's sinking down into the water. What takes place after that is the crowning of the Virgin by the Trinity. And anybody who knows Jungian psychology knows that the masculine Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are imbalanced in Jung's estimation. And what the church misses in its uh, iconography was, is, uh, is the Divine Mother. Uh, although he said that the assumption of the Virgin in, uh, as dogma in the 1950s sort of corrected that to a degree. So you see here the Trinity turning into what Jung saw as a balanced quaternio, and the mother, mater, matter is redeemed in this process. So what happens after that is Christ rises as the cor corpus glorificationis, the gold representing spirit, and he's wearing red, which is a symbol of the earth, matter redeemed. Jung says about the, the Rosarium that it is a sacrament not of maternal mind, but of maternal matter. In the Kabbalah, it's said that only one who understands the demonic and the divine can understand the underlying unity of the two realms. And in a conversation I had with my outside reader, Hillary, this week, she reminded me that Malkut, the lowest in Sekhirot, is often associated with the Lord of Death and with Yama himself. So that takes us to the uh, chapter on death. Are we doing it for time? We're fine. No, we're, we're fine. fine. Okay. Um, I want to start this chapter with a quote from Jung uh, that he wrote on the death of his wife. Death is indeed a fearful piece of brutality. There is no sense pretending otherwise. So I, we're talking about symbols very nicely here. But anybody who's experienced the death of a loved one knows that this is, this is the truth. And the mother herself felt that death was a horror. Not because she was afraid of it, but because it's because nature in its natural course of evolution is so wasteful to create so many conscious beings only to watch them suffer and die. So the mother made it her yoga to rend the veil that separates heaven and earth by defeating the Lord of Death in order to break the habituated belief that exists in the, every single cell of the body, which is where she focused her yoga, that all life ends in death, and ultimately to transform and spiritualize matter. The mother uh, saw death, uh, she talked about death in a number of ways in the agenda. I just want to highlight three of them here. That death is a habit or a belief that's rooted in the cells of the body, as I mentioned. That death is a threshold or a mask or a veil, as we saw in uh, Subbatry. And also, this comes from Theon's cosmology, and she brings this up a number of times in the agenda, and I find it really fascinating. It's kind of a Gnostic cosmology, Gnostic Kabbalistic. Death is the third of four angelic creator beings, Theon tells us, that were life, love, li uh, light, love, life, and truth, who became asuric, or demonic, um, darkness, hatred, death, and falsehood through their egoic belief and their independence from God, and ultimately their omnipotence. So they were sent here to do a job, and then they started to experience them as separate from the source, just as we all do, you know, in our egoity. And it was the Divine Mother's task then to enter creation and convert these beings back to their original form. That, um, that figure, uh, who was the Demiurge, um, is, uh, is also associated with Yama. Yama is this incredibly rich mythologist, and I wanted to discuss him a little bit because it, it can really help us to understand, like, to spread out and understand some of the ramifications of, of the story, and especially the mother's way of looking at her task. Yama in uh, Hindu mythology is the first mortal to die, uh, one of many. Right? He's the lord of death and the guardian of directions. He's the Dharmaraj, the king, of, uh, the king of law, but he's also the king of this world, very much the way that the Western Satan is the king of this world. And this was fascinating to me. He's a child of the sun, and in some texts, he's one of the 108 nuns of the suns. In, in other words, he's an Aditya. He's a child of the mother from the sun. Savitri, if you remember, is also a child of the sun. And I found it really fascinating that they have this amazing relationship with one another that's really filial. On a symbolic level, they're brother and sister. And one of the genius, one of the absolute genius, uh, how can I say this, one of the absolutely uh, strokes of genius that Sri Aurobindo has in the writing of Savitri is that Savitri has this kind of relationship with three people in Savitri. 
not only with Yama, but also with Ashwapati, who's her father, and with Satyavan, who's her husband. This kind of recursive relationship that you see in the Sri Yantra um, is really remarkable. Uh, I'm not going to go through this list, but I just wanted to point out that Yama has many etymological relationships to other gods that share a similar stem root, uh, which supposedly is the Indo-European form, Yam, which means twin or combine or restrain. And it's amazing how many uh, deities and beings share this root and share these qualities, like Giannis, who is the oldest of Roman gods, the firstborn god of gates, doors, transitions. And he has two faces, one which looks into this world and one which looks into the transcendent. So this is something of the complex nature of the mythology. These gods often have, uh, whether they have uh, a name, the same stem name or a different name like Varuna or Saturn, they, they share in similar qualities in a kind of a mix and match fashion. They often have a dual nature. They're often a twin, uh, where they represent the night and the other represents the day. They're often obstructors or gatekeepers or guardians. They're often depicted with a noose, which is for binding or restraining. They're associated with bulls or serpents, which has astrological significance. And I'll go into this a little bit later with the serpent. Often they're seen as demiurges, false creators that usurp the prerogative of the one god and then create the fallen material universe where the one god has created the ideal universe. They're often associated with space-time, the physical universe. And the Milky Way, uh, uh, Makara, who is the Vaharn of Varuna, is always pictured, with, studded with the stars of the sky. Uh, also, their body is sometimes rend, rent in, asunder and turned into the universe of the earth. Does anybody need a breather? Do you want to stand? Do jumping jacks? Are we okay? Everybody's okay? Um, in order to go deeper into the mythology, I undertook uh, uh, an um, amplification of uh, the myth of the sun door, um, which uh, from Ananda Kumaraswamy and David Gordon White's work. work. Very simply, to go over this, um, the sun has various rays, and, uh, and sometimes it's 12 rays. In Theon's system, it's 12 rays. In um, uh, Kumaraswamy says that uh, in most systems, it's seven. The 12 is often zodiacal, and the seven is often planetary. One of the rays is invisible, and it passes down through the crown of the skull, through the Sahasrara, uh, between, in the Brahma Rondra, between the pituitary and pineal, and then passes down into the heart of every single individual. The adept, the great yogi is the one who can connect with this single ray of light and follow the path back up through the sun, which is seen as either a doorway or having a door in it, and then to transcendence. If they can do this consciously, then they can pass back down through that door and back into the world of imminence, thus affecting, effectively becoming immortal. They can enter back into their body, or if they drop their body into a, another individual's body, or even into an animal or a plant if they decide. So you see that this is the yogic path of ascent and return that I spoke about in terms of Ashwapati and Sri Aurobindo. Um, it's also the path of crystallization that leads to immortality, right? the crystallized uh, awareness. Um, and it also brings up this motif of the sun as a two-way door. And this is important to remember that I said that uh, Yama is the lord of this world. And he represents a mask of God, of the divine transcendent. Uh, we'll come back to this. It also has astrological and astronomical significance. And it deals with the nature of as above, so below, with the universe as the body, and the body as the universe, and somehow mysteriously they're the same thing. Kumar Swami points out that you even find this motif in Western, Western uh, stories. This is from the Zohar, the Kabbalistic Zohar, where uh, there is a door that passes through heaven, and uh, at the center of that firmament there's an opening through which souls soar up along a, a, a pillar. And the pillar is represented here in this diagram uh, as the Jed pillar of Osiris, right? Osiris is the, the proto-anthropos of Egyptian cosmology. And this is this actually the Jed pillar represents his uh, spine and rib cage. And it holds apart the ecliptic of the zodiac in two places. One is the lunar gate, which is the Janu Inferni, and that passes through Gemini and Taurus going to Cancer. That's the gate of initiation or the initiate. That doesn't require a death to pass through it. It's the gate of the mysteries. But then this other gate, which takes place actually in, this, in the southern sky, it's reversed, uh, is the solar or golden gate. That's the Janua Sealy. And that passes through Scorpio and Sagittarius to Capricorn. I'm sorry? To Capricorn. 
Uh, and that's the gate of death and resurrection, which is the gate of the avatar. Kumara Swami says this is the gate that Christ takes at his death. And I argue that this is the gate that Savitri takes. She passes down into the underworld, into the realm of death, for transfiguration and trans transformation. As I said, it's also related to the serpent, wonderfully illustrated by this picture of the Milky Way here that looks kind of like a serpent. Um, the serpent is this wonderful symbol, is the firstborn of all beings. And as an Ouroboros, right, the, the energy is supposedly closed within the Ouroboros. So you find in the myth of Ritra, for instance, where Indra breaks Ritra open so that the seven rivers of creation can flow. That um, what Jung says is that the Ouroboros is the closed Alembic. It's the, it's the alchemical, um, the alchemical st structure within which this tremendous energy is built up, built up, built up like the rebus, and then it explodes into into creation, uh, which is illustrated by uh, Sheshnag and Vishnu creating the universe. And you see here this green mass is actually the Milky Way uh, crossing the ecliptic in two places in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Kumar Swami says that this, this coiled energy uh, is this Kundalini energy, so either coiled or extended. He said that you can also see this in the Hindu temple, the central fire that releases the smoke that goes up through the lafar or the hole in the roof. And if you can see, I don't know if you can see the yogi back here. So it's also the Kundalini energy that passes through the yogi's body. So whether it's at the cosmic level or at the earthly level or in the individual, it's the same energy that's moving. And I argue that that's the energy that you see actually moving in Macha Mandir. The difference is with Sri Aurobindo and the mother, they drew the energy down rather than moving the energy up. But you can see that it's really the same, the same kind of iconographic form. The energy moves into the central meditation chamber, which is in the upper third, or the Brahma Chandra, right, of the, of the temple that she built or designed in, in Oregon. Um, this is from Norelli Bachelet's work, which is controversial, but I think it has a lot of really key insights. She says that the Matra Mandir represents Mount Meru, the central mountain of creation, and that the light that passes through it from heaven into earth, because it passes through the crystal and it goes down into a pool of water underneath, passes along the Capricorn Cancer axis. Um, so what happens, uh, oh, and also uh, just to point out that this is the grounds of the Matra Mandir itself in the upper right where you see it kind of as the central sun, and it's surrounded by this moat that was being dug when I was there a few years ago, which kind of looks like the Ouroboros. So it's the containment, it's a containment which can build up this tremendous energy, which I argue is for the transformation of death into life, symbolically, but that's what's happening within this temple. Uh, also, if you look at the grounds of Oroville itself, uh, it's, it's, the ground plan is that it's shaped like a galaxy with the, with the Matra Mandir as kind of the galactic center, or the central sun, which is a very theosophical idea that you also find in Theon's work. Now this was fascinating to me, um, and I, I promise that this will kind of all feed into what I'm saying. Theon's crystals. Um, Theon's uh, had, had this wonderful cosmology. Uh, this, is a, this is a Rosicrucian diagram, but I think that it illustrates Theon's ideas really beautifully. The mother emanates the light of the father down into creation. There are 12 beings in, in Theon's system, each of which holds a crystal that catches and augments one of the 12 rays of the sun. Four of these beings are the creator beings. They're here in the center, and you see that one of them here is catching the sun's rays and bringing it down to this central figure here. Now, what happens in all Gnostic myths is something goes wrong. Something always goes wrong. And whether it's through the auspices of the child that the mother wants to have who becomes the demiurge or through some other, for some other reason, two creations actually occur. Now, the, I said that the Father's creation, the creation of the divine, uh, is, uh, is an ideal creation. But the creation of the demiurge is a material creation. It's seen it as fallen. Um, so light, love, life, and truth become darkness, hatred, death, and falsehood. Now, in Theon's system, darkness and hatred have been reconverted. They're, they are now the angelic beings of light and love accessible to us all. But it was the mother in this incarnation who was done. To de had to descend into material creation to redeem it through the transformation of the, as of the asura of death into the, back into the angel of life. And I, I, I say this with all sincerity, my own personal experience of the mother is that she embodied this completely and fully. If you want to call it a symbol, that's, that's okay. If you want to call it real, that's okay also. But she lived her life as if this was real um, in a really extraordinary way, both she and Sri Aurobindo. 
So in terms of the two creations, and you see Yamas lurking in the background here, that um, it brings back up the notion of Yama as the Dharmaraj, the lord of law and also the king of this world. And this reminded me of uh, Swedenborg's uh, idea that the sun is the sun that we see is actually the sun of death. It, everything that happens below the sun is happening in the world of death because everything here changes, it's not permanent. On the other side of the sun is a face that looks up into the transcendent. So you see it's the same symbol. Swedenborg, interestingly, has, was, uh, was an inf influence on Theon through his student Andrew Jackson Davis, whose student was Pascal Beverly Randolph, whose writings are core writings in the canon of the uh, Hermetic Brother of Luxor. This also reminded me of Parmenides' idea that only that which does not perish is real. So what's real is the Divine Father, if you will, um, but that Divine Energy that is transcendent. And uh, as I argue, the Matra Mandir is a temple for the transformation of death into life. So you have this idea of the Sun as both the face of God and as Sri Aurobindo puts in the Shroud of Ignorance that the Mother removes. And this is from the Ishu uh, the lid, like a lid of a vessel of Sun, your gold covers that entrance to the truth. Please open the door to lead me to the truth. This is the door that the mother supposedly broke open in 1956 to allow the energy of the supermantle to descend. So essentially, to you know, bring it to a close, the sun whose rays can mean life or death is a symbol for the doorway between the worlds. Now I could have ended the dissertation here, but I became really fascinated with this idea of the door, the passage through the doorway. What happens when you've actually passed through this? So I, I, I added this extra chapter on death as transformation. This is a wonderful quote from the mother. Nature suddenly understood that this newborn consciousness does not seek to reject her, but wants to embrace her entirely. Really beautiful. The goal of the yoga is a new creation on earth, and the corpus glorificationis, this is Theon's term, in Sri Aurobindo's terminology, it's the supermental agnostic being. Theon talked about there being seven cosmic epochs. This is a very theosophical idea. We are at the very end of the sixth cosmic epoch. In each of these epochs, everything closes down. The flood occurs, or the universe just ends, and then it comes back into being, and the whole thing has to be started back up again. But now, the human being is finally at that stage in which we can affect the union of heaven and earth, and there will be no need for things to fold back in. Sri Aurobindo called this no more pralana, right? the, the Hindu idea. Interestingly, Jung um, wrote about this also in Ion, where he talked about the transition from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. So you see uh, uh, the Pisces are the two fish that are separate from one another, but in Aquarius, the individual carries the water on their own body, the water being the spirit, so it's the unification of spirit and matter. So the transcendent and the imminent become one in the human being, who is the central symbol and focal point of the divine plan. I then uh, take up the kind of mythology of the rending of the veil, um, the, the tearing of this boundary. In the Temple of Solomon, the veil uh, sits between the Holy of Holies and the main court of the temple, and uh, behind that is the Transcendent Father, and only the high priest can go there, and only on certain high holy days. It's the threshold between uh, spiritual and human worlds. Uh, David Ulancey wrote two papers on the Gospel of Mark, where he points out that the rending of the veil at Jesus' baptism transformation and death takes place figuratively, right, spiritually, where the heavens open at his uh, baptism and transfiguration, but at his death, the physical veil of the temple is torn. So Jung says that uh, the imminent, the transcendent pierces into the in imminent at moments of grace, and these moments of grace are moments where the tension of opposites is held, at, like it's Christ's death, where he's crucified, right, on the uh, the, in the imminent and the transcendent realms. And if you hold that, trend, that tension of opposites long enough, the symbol can come as the third thing that doesn't exist otherwise. Jung said that these are moments of grace that we all experience. He also said that they happen non-causally. Uh, we don't really know why as synchronicities, and these are material manifestations of spirit. But the question that I ask is, what does it mean that the physical veil of the temple is torn at his death? The physical veil of the temple. To, to go into this, I looked at the myth of Inanna and Ereshkigal. Inanna is the queen of heaven, right? She's this kind of transcendent queen who joins heaven and earth. 
But she wants to visit her sister, Ereshkigal, the queen of the underworld. In order to do that, she has to pass through seven gates, and at each gate she has to remove a veil until all that's left is a carcass, a, a hunk of rotting meat that her sister then hangs up behind her throne as a trophy. Jung says that the psyche actually has two poles. That's archetype and instinct. The archetype is kind of the doorway into the transcendent spirit, but the instinct is our doorway into the psychoid, into the substrate of matter. And this is where the secret of death is found. This is why the mother's yoga was down, into, into death and into her body. That's where the biochemical roots of instinct, inaccessible to psyche, uh, uh, biochemical roots of instinct inaccessible to the psyche are. And this is the bridge between, uh, between psyche and matter. Marie Louise von Franz, in her wonderful book on dreams and death, which discusses the dreams of people from 7 to 70 to 107 approaching death, whether they know it or not, she says their dreams often have universal similarities to them. She said that the Egyptians talk about this. She felt unconsciously in Egyptian funerary ritual as a symbol uniting spirit and matter. Um, this is about the journey of the, the Ba soul, right, which separates from the Ka soul and the body and then passes through the body of Nut on its transformative journey. The Ka soul stays with the body, and the body itself is mummified, and, and it's transformed. And then they're rejoined in the, in, um, in the final stage. Um, I, I, I encountered this idea, I hadn't known this before, that the scarab or the dung beetle was called Kepri in Egyptian, which means he who has come into being, um, pushes a, a ball of dung across the desert sands into a hole, and then from that hole, all of the little baby beetles come. The Egyptians thought that this beetle was only masculine, so, that it was talking, so they said it's a kind of a symbol for parthenogenesis, where actual parthenogenesis is taking place. And it symbolized the sun moving through the sky and then actually going down beneath the earth, passing through the body of Nut, and then uh, being resurrected. So um, it resurrects as life in its, in its kind of multiplicity. This is the symbol of the seed of the resurrection lying in the body of corruption, which is the earth, in death. <coughs> Von Franz also points out that natron, the salt that's used to desiccate the mummy, Comes from the same. The word comes from the same root as God in Egyptian. So the mummy is transformed into a transfigured one. This is a chemical process of deification. The body of the deceased becomes at the same time a multitude of gods, right, as it comes back into life. However, in the image of the sun god, it's also the unity of all gods. And I just want to point out that this is Hatshepsut, right, the the female pharaoh. The mother said that this was one of her incarnations, and I think it is so cool that you, if you're a devotee, right, that this could very well be. Uh, the physical remains of one of the incarnations of the mother kind of boggles the mind, if you're inclined that way. Um, Jung talked about this in terms of the soul Niger in alchemy, the black sun, right? And he said that no new life can arise, say the alchemists, without the death of the old. Now Jung is also talking about this transformation symbolically because he says we have to die at the end and no one knows what happens next. So he says that just as a door opens to one who knocks on it, or a way opens out to the wayfarer who seeks it, so when you relate to your own transcendental center, you initiate a process of conscious development which leads to oneness and wholeness. So this is where the mundus archetypus, or the archetype of the earth, is united with the archetype of the self in Jungian psychology. But I would argue that it doesn't really matter whether you put the doorway in the Brahma Randra, or at the back of the heart, where the light resides, or in the cells of the body where the mother did, or you externalize it into the sun, the doorway in the sun. That, as von Franz said, death is a problem of a threshold of perception between the, the living and the dead. The mother called this changing government, right? Changing government from ego to absolute, as Jung pointed out, from ego to self. I, I was uh, privileged to attend a dissertation, I don't know if any of you were able to do this, of Jeremy Zhu. Uh, who was one of the EWP students, our EWP students a few years ago. And it, it was marvelous. I mean, it taught me so much. He was talking about Chan Buddhism and consciousness in Chan Buddhism. And he pointed out that in the ox herding pictures, or actually he says that they're cow herding pictures. This is a cow, which is a, a, a symbol of the Divine Mother. Interesting. He said the cow herding pictures. He said that in the transition to the eighth circle, the eighth circle is always seen, or the eighth picture is always seen as an empty circle. And it's often, or usually, uh, taken to represent the ineffability of enlightenment. What can you say about it? 
But he also pointed out that there's this discussion that's been taking place over the generations in Chan Buddhist circles that um, what it may actually represent is the fact that in this change of government or this change of state, that an actual death has to take place. The consciousness that you are tied to, that you associate with, has to leave, it has to disappear. And there's, it doesn't matter whether your enlightenment is instantaneous, there's this razor, razor thin moment out of time and out of space that uh, mythologically is called the eternal moment. There's no time or space there. It could be a nanosecond or a billion years, it doesn't really matter. So in that space, this transformation takes place, and the mother, at the very end of her life, she, she, she stopped talking with Sakram three months before she died, and in the very last month of conversation, she said to him that her body seemed to have a wish to go to sleep and then to awake only after it was transformed. And Sakram immediately said, this is Sleeping Beauty. Sleeping Beauty goes to sleep for a hundred years, but to everybody who's in the castle, it's just one night of sleep. So it speaks of this remarkable transformative process. <coughs> now Jung said that evidently the veil of Maya cannot be lifted by a merely rational resolve. It requires a most thoroughgoing and persevering preparation consisting in full payment of debts to life. For as long as unconditional attachment through cupiditus exists, the veil is not lifted and the heights of a consciousness free of contents and free of illusion are not attained. Uh, nor can any trick nor any deceit bring this about. It is an ideal that can ultimately be realized only in death, right? This is the alchemical secret, that death is the final transformation. Until then, there are the real and the relatively real figures of the unconscious uh, initiation. Now, this is from Theon, but I think that it really states the mother's idea and uh, really succinctly. It is only in indissoluble union with the divinity who is within him that man will be able to attain the progressive transformation on earth, which is his full right. Whoever teaches that retrogressive transformation, or mortality, uh, is the predestined, legitimized end of man, Jung, take note, is therefore the enemy of man. Of right, man is immortal. And yet, the mother says that if the supermental is to manifest on earth, something of it has to relate to the physical. In other words, the supermental itself is, is transitional as well. It's a transitional being between the human and the divine such a divine. Now Jung wrote that because the body, even when conceived as the corpus glorificationis, is grosser than anima and spiritus, a remnant of earth, and I love that, of the remnant of earth necessarily clings to it, albeit a very subtle one. And if you see, peeking back behind the words here, the yin-yang symbol, Jung said, he, he used this as a symbol for this idea, that no matter how deeply you go into the light, there's always a little bit of dark. And no matter how deeply you go into the dark, there's always a little bit of light. If you have one without the other, it's imbalanced, and existence will disappear. This brings me to my conclusions. Sri Aurobindo's 88th aphorism, he says, This world was built by death that he might live. Remember the Dharma Raj, right? Wilt thou abolish death? Then life too will perish. Thou canst not abolish death, but thou mayst transform it into a greater living. Nolini, who was the mother's physician, Sri Aurobindo's physician and one of their senior disciples, wrote after the mother withdrew from her body that the mother's body belongs to the old creation. It was not meant to be the new body. It served its purpose well. For a new mutation, a new procedure was needed. Death was the first stage of that process. In a televised interview, Jung once said that we're a, we're a structure that's pre-established through the genes our biological or physiological function follows a pattern that makes us specifically human. No man is born without it. We're only deeply unconscious of these facts because we live all by our senses and outside of ourselves. In other words, from the Big Bang forward, death is a necessary counterpoint to life. The mother wanted to transform that, and thus the structure of the universe herself. Remember, she, she's identified or transformed parent to the Divine Mother herself, which is imminence. Her work, she was alchemical in the best sense of the word. It was about the glorification of matter, and not the aggrandizement, right? the glorification of matter, uh, in the alchemically transformed resurrected body. Her defeat of death meant the breaking of the golden door that obstructs our contact with the source, the release of the supermental force, and the promise of the final union of heaven and earth. 
Within integral yoga, the mother is typically seen through the filter of Sri Aurobindo, as I mentioned earlier. And I've argued that her use of symbols was influenced by her particular Western upbringing, especially Theon. I'd also argue that through the process of amplification, one can begin to appreciate both her uniqueness, uh, the uniqueness of her vision and her universality. In the dissertation itself, I attempted to hold the tension of opposites, right, between the mother and Jung, and also between the mother and Jung and myself. Um, and I would say, in all humility, really, uh, as, and this is from Jung, this quote from Jung, I had my eye on the central fire. I'm trying to put some mirrors around it to show it to others. Sometimes the gaps don't fit together exactly. I can't help that. Look what I'm trying to point to. What I'm trying to point to is this. This is an icon, a Russian icon, that shows the nativity of Christ. And here is this light, the central light of creation, the Divine Father uh, manifesting as the, uh, the star of Bethlehem. And a single ray passes down into what looks like a crystal that sits above the halo of the Christ child. <clears throat> Mother and child are sitting within this wonderful kind of temple-like earth uh, with all of its roughness and jaggedness. And then if you look over here, this is the crystal within the Matra Mandir, with the central sun that's raining down a single light into this crystal. This, this is the cosmic embryo, that's Theon's term, but this is the cosmic embryo of Sri Aurobindo, the Divine Father, the Mother called him the Lord, right? So this is, this is what it represents. He is, this is the embryo of, the, of uh, Sri Aurobindo's psychic being that will be reborn, as the Mother said, as the very first Superman to be. But, even though, even though we look at them in that way, or people who are devotees look at them in that way, the mother had a caveat, and, she, and this is really important, that just to, to look at people kind of symbolically and really believe it in the, in the core of yourself is really important. But at the same time, spiritual experience means contact with the divine in oneself or without, which comes to the same thing in that domain. And it is an experience identical everywhere in all countries among all peoples and even in all ages. If you meet the divine, you meet it always and everywhere in the same way. Difference comes in because between the experience and its formulation, there is almost an abyss. Directly, you have spiritual experience which takes place always in the inner consciousness. It is translated into your external consciousness and defended there one way or another according to your education, your faith, your mental predisposition. There is only one truth, one reality forms through which it may be expressed. Thank you. I'd like to um, invite members of the committee to make comments. Jim or Hillary, do you want to? Seeing that in a way I'm the um, really the junior member of the committee. I should go first. Um, um, well, I think you can start your own school. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the um, uh, this was uh, this dissertation really was an adventure in consciousness. I love I love this. Dissertation. <laughs> and, the, um, and the places that you dug into that nobody really uh, has gone to very much, connecting up with Mother, really, um, it's, it's, it's truly amazing. Um, I'm, I'm sure that um, there will be uh, people in the Sri Aurobindo uh, Mother axis that will uh, be outraged by, <laughs> by uh, uh, some of the things that you uh, bring forward. But really, it's crystal clear as you, uh, as you put it um, and, and, and bring the things on. I love that you have one of Max Theon's books. Mm -hmm. Of course, Theon was the son of a rabbi and was very, that uh, seems deeply knowledgeable in Kabbalah. Um, uh, I, 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 except for um, sort of the uh, greatest praise, I don't um, have, uh, I was trying to think of a good question. Of course, the Jungian parts of this, uh, which I loved and are, are lyrical almost in their presentation, um, I can't say much about because uh, I'll let my um, esteemed colleagues to, uh, say more about that because I know so little uh, of 
you want me to accept. It, what, all I can say is that what you were saying seemed to ring true. Um, uh, if what you say about Jung is correct, then um, these things and these connections are are real um, and uh, their association. Um, but um, I guess the one question that occurred to me is, um, it seems that uh, Mother and Sri Aurobindo really did an incredible East-West thing. You know, I mean, um, uh, she really was a, a spiritual savant from, from the time she was a child and was schooled by the greatest sort of esoteric uh, uh, philosopher of her age, Max Dion, and, and others, um, and um, came uh, to Sri Aurobindo, at least when she arrived at the ashram, as a fully developed spiritual being, really, of, of just the highest caliber. Um, uh, but um, interestingly, they fit hand in glove. Uh, you, know, you can uh, switch uh, roles, who's hand and who's glove. Uh, because they really uh, had a mesh uh, that was extraordinary. I guess my question was, would be is, is there, what might there be uh, in uh, uh, the um, spiritual trajectory of either that doesn't quite fit the other? <laughs> you know, uh, are there rough edges somewhere that you might have seen? Well, one of the first things that I was told when I said that I was going to undertake this by one of my professors was that Jung really isn't adequate to discuss Sri Aurobindo and the mother because, mm -hmm. you know, because of his tendency to, for, towards psychological reductionism. Mm -hmm. And although I completely disagree, because I really think that Jung's psychology is only about one thing, really. I mean, apart from trying to help people who are in crisis, it's really about kind of unfolding or explicating the spiritual process as it transpires within our psychological being. So he's just looking at how these the symbols arise psychologically. Um, the mother and Sri Aurobindo were very dismissive of Western psychology, but they were also looking, I think, mainly at kind of Freudian psychology. And um, they, didn't, they made some comments about Jung, but I don't think that they delved into him too deeply. And this is also early Jung, and Jung underwent his own evolution and changed tremendously by the end of his life, undergoing profound spiritual experiences. To me, the one difference, um, and I showed that they, you know, they kind of came from the same container, so it's a little bit tricky because they're working with the same symbol sets and often the same language, but the one difference was over this idea of death, whether death needs to actually take place. The mother in Sri Aurobindo, the mother felt that she could actually transform the body uh, without having to undergo death. And Jung said, no, you have to, everybody dies. That's, that's the essence of existence itself. And, but at the very end of her, his life, Jung was saying that the psyche says that there's something that says that we survive this process. And at the end of her life, the mother was saying that she didn't think that her body was actually going to be com able to complete the transformation. Mm -hmm. And she began to think that maybe it wasn't necessary for the transformation, but she wasn't sure. And she was a, she was a truth teller. She was very honest. Sokprem in the agenda tends to spin things in his little aside comments. But the mother was really clear. She didn't know. She said, must say 200 times in the course of the agenda, we know nothing. I know nothing. This is a mystery that I'm delving into. Now, if a person who's delved that deeply into the mystery can say, I know nothing, where does that place me? <laughs> um, so I just... I trust her, I, am, I entered into the reality that she was working within as fully and completely as I could, and I entered into Jung's reality, and their, their differences are more in the particulars than in the more universal elements, and I think that they're really kind of looking at the same thing. Uh, and we do them a disservice when we begin to um, look at them with a jaundiced eye, or the hermeneutics of suspicion, or um, with the dismissal. And often, followers of particular teachers will, will do that. And I tried really hard not to do that. And I flip-flopped a lot. I would get angry at the mother, I'd get angry at your window, I'd get angry at Jung. Um, I am, in my core, a Jungian. But he taught me to appreciate the mother in a way that I don't know that I would have been capable of. I don't know if that answers the question. Just to follow up on, uh, on Jim's question, I have to say, as the 
had a Jungian on the committee that I think your reading of Jung is very profound and very correct. Um, I, I actually, what I feel is that the service that this dissertation um, renders is that it makes the mother's own teachings psychologically comprehensible in a way that they are not when they're read simply on their own. I think that's the first thing we've done. And actually, although it's a wonderful presentation, I do want to say to the audience here that I think the dissertation itself, it's in the dissertation itself that you actually make, I think, what the major contribution is, which is it's this, the psychological meaning of the mother's work in the light of Jungian psychology. That's the scholarly contribution, and that's the contribution I hope you will publish. And that's what you say, Jim, and it will enrage some of the devotees uh, who reject Jung as inadequate and so forth and so on. But I think you actually show in the dissertation that what Jung is doing is very relevant, not only in terms of the ideas presented, but another unique contribution, I think, of your study is that you relate the cultural, historic environment in which both Jung and the mother lived. No one else has done that, that I know of. I think it's an extremely, extremely important contribution. Um, let me just say a couple of other things. I, I do think relating um, uh, the mother not only to Jungian psychology, but to the, the whole history of Western occultism is another important area that is also something that gets rejected by devotees who only want to see the mother as I don't know if you agree with me, Hillary, but they only want to see the mother as original, and only the mother has these ideas. Well, yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, and, St and Stephanie is showing that she's actually part of a historic cultural context. She's not alone in that. So I, that, that was really very striking. And I just also want to say that um, you just alluded to it. It's that I think you, whatever your inner struggles. Um, I do have to say, by the way, just um, because you've seen the presentation on the symbolism, I actually got impatient with all the symbolism because there was so much of it. It almost got overwhelming. And I, I actually want to thank Robert, who made a key intervention in this dissertation, <laughs> by telling Stefan, who reported to me, you are done. <laughs> this dissertation is finished. You know, it's over. You know, and I, that intervention was critical <laughs> because although this, what you presented here was really fascinating, I kept pushing for what is the, what is your argument here? What is the meaning of the of this realm of symbolism? And I think in the dissertation you actually did do it. Um, I do, here's one question that I do have to have. I wanted to ask you, you say, um, about uh, death in the mother and in Jung. Um, let's see, I have a note about it, what you say. Um, well, I, I'll just get to know, just ask you directly. You know, you've done a very careful study of death, both in the mother and in Jung, and I wanted to ask you, how has that affected your own view of death? And where do you, and, and, and a central part of the, of the dissertation that I understand is that um, there is a real difference between Jung and the mother on death. And I wonder, where do you come down in terms of your own understanding? Yeah, well, it's complicated. I think like the Sri Um I, if, if, if I may, can I, can I root this in personal experience? I hope so. Okay. Yeah, we'd like you to. Um, when I was very young, a year and a half old, I had my first two memories. Whether they're recovered or not, I don't know. They make sense symbolically. My first memory was being sitting in a high chair in my mother's kitchen in Pennsylvania. Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, and the light was streaming into the kitchen, this beautiful golden light, and my mother was doing my favorite thing, preparing my breakfast or my dinner. And I was just filled with this amazing sense of warmth and love. And I remember that really plainly. 
And then at some point later, I followed my brother and some of my cousins into uh, the foundation of a farmhouse in my neighborhood that had burned down and it was being rebuilt. And I think there was tar paper that was over the central room in the basement. I followed them down. I was a year and a half old. And they disappeared into the dark um, chamber, this dark room. And I must not have had object constancy, I don't know, but as soon as they disappeared, I panicked. And I remember standing there and screaming, screaming at the top of my lungs until, for my mother to come and pull me out, until a neighbor came and pulled me out. Uh, a woman who my mother said I promptly fell in love with, and then I used to escape from our yard to go to her house <laughs> to meet with her. I've had a split anima ever since. Uh, interestingly, if it's a recovered memory, I was also a cesarean. So I was pulled from my mother's womb. And I find this really interesting, the way that the symbols just within my own body have resonated throughout my entire life. I went through the, the journey that brought me to the school was a crisis, a typical midlife crisis. But it was precipitated by a few things that happened in my life. Um, my father died, my uh, best friend committed suicide. A whole bunch of things happened all around the same time. But it was part of this process. And the process began with the birth of my daughter. When my daughter was born, she was born at home, and we mistimed the contraction, so my wife and I were alone when she came, the midwife came a little bit later. And we were alone in the quiet, it was New York City, but it was a Sunday morning, it was very quiet. And when Zoe came into the world, I could hear, I swear, I could hear angels singing. I mean, I heard them. And I could see her dark body emerging from her mother, and I could see light in the corners of the room begin to coalesce and shot into her body. And this dark little purple body began to unfold like a chrysalis and she began to be filled with light. And the room around us became somehow dark. A number of years later I was at seminary and the head of the seminary was a rabbi, Joseph Gelberman. And he, he was on an ecumenical council with Swami Satchidananda, the guru to the hippies, right? And Satchidananda came to see us and gave us a darshan and he said, he just came and he sat in front of the group. There was a small group like this, and he said, I'm just going to sit here and get ready, and then I'm going to sit quietly with my eyes closed, and then I'll open my eyes and I'll just gaze out. And uh, if anybody has a question, you can ask, ask the question. So I didn't know what to expect. I had no experience with gurus. He kind of did his robes and he sat, and then he opened his eyes, and reality just changed completely. The room was filled with a golden light. I could see. <laughs> I mean, it was a golden light that was filled with spectral colors. There were, there were balls of light running down his hair and flowing out into the room. It was a complete, full-on kind of entheogenic experience without anything. I was stone-cold sober, and this happened. And every, people in the room were saying, you know, do you have to be a vegetarian to do yoga? <laughs> Why is anybody saying anything? And the Swami said, the Swami said to me, the Swami said to the group, uh, after he was done, he said, anybody that wants to have a private darshan can come into this office. And I couldn't move. I could not get out of my seat as long as he was in this space. And it wasn't until he left that suddenly I came to and I went and I grabbed the robe of his disciple and I said, this is what, you have to listen to this, is what just happened to me, I can't believe what just happened to me. And the disciple was like, you know, you're fortunate. Some people wait their entire lives for something like this to happen. And now you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to repeat this. And on some, it was really right. The third experience that has to do with life uh, was at my father's death. My father died at home through hospice and I was alone with him when he died. I was staying in his room. And he waited until everybody in the house fell asleep. And I fell asleep literally for no more than three minutes because I looked at the clock. It was one o'clock in the morning. When I, I awoke with a start because I was like I was shaking. And the room was absolutely silent. And I realized that he had stopped breathing. And I went over to his body and I checked. And he had in fact died. So I went and woke up the rest of the house. And I came back and I was alone with him for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And as I stood, I placed my hand on his hand and I could feel that it was getting cold and on his leg and it was getting cold and I could feel the heat moving back to, to the center of his body and I placed my hand over his heart and suddenly a force pushed my hand off of his heart and I watched a plume of light leave his body and enter the room and his body became dark at that point and the room became filled with light. So it was like the reverse of the experience with my daughter, where the light entered her body. Here the light left the body. 
And all I can say, and it was my father, and I loved him, and I miss him terribly, but all I can say is in that moment I knew beyond a shadow of any doubt that everything, everything, everything in this universe is exactly the way it should be. Everything is perfect the way it is. And it's just my misunderstanding that makes things wrong. And that really was kind of like the impulse. Now, there was another experience that I had that was of the darkness and the descent into the earth that's too long to tell here. Um, that showed me the other dimension of it. Um, but I've, the, the dissertation in some ways was really an attempt that I undertook to explore these experiences and more that I already have. And it only deepened my commitment to this idea that the universe is really perfect and it's my inability to understand it that makes it not so. Okay, so that actually is the view of Jung and the mother. They have exactly that view, correct? Yeah. So you're saying that your research kind of confirmed your own experience. Well, and the mother said that there's, there are two paths you can take, right, to the source. One is the straight path, which is the one that she took, right. the one that she understood, and the one that she didn't understand was the meandering path that most people take. And I'm a born meanderer, I can't help it. So I just ha I had to do this for my intellectual, for the monkey on my back. That, and, and I'm hoping that I can put it behind me now, I don't know. <laughs> well, it, it turns out that it's more than just a personal odyssey that you have created. It is relevant to a lot of other people. But I think it's important that you hear that. And we need to find ways to have you teaching more, or writing more, or publishing more, so that some of this can you know, be shared. OK, that's all. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm, I'm overwhelmed <laughs> by this magnificent piece of work. Um, I learned so much <laughs> about the mother and her, and her odyssey. But I think the thing that really hit me the most was a whole explication that you had, which is major in this dissertation, on the psychic being. I, I mean, I, I, of all the studies I've done with, with these dimensions, I didn't know that uh, Max Sion had introduced the psychic being. This was all new for me. And I think for this, you know, for our studies in integral yoga, Integralism, integral studies, is terribly important to see the, the inception of this, actually, this idea of the psychic being coming from that source. That's big. And so, my question, I may have mentioned it to you later on, uh, because the mother is seen in this whole universal context, that her body was is a universal dimension here, that she undertook the journey as the Divine Mother. I'm interested in your thoughts about the psychic being as permeated her experience and how that would relate in some way to the chakra system. Because it was always my big question when I was doing these studies is that what happened to the Ananda Kanda dimension of the heart chakra? Because somehow in the yoga, as I remember it and studying it, there was no connection between those two. But other yogis have made that connection, but not with the psychic being. So for me, this is a piece of work you brought through, which is absolutely uh, unique, magnificent, and you know, like in a dissertation, we bring in new knowledge. This is big. Because looking at all of us <laughs> as we undertake the evolution of our own spirit and so forth, to, to be able to take a hold of this and see it in our bodies, did you see anything in your studies that connected with the Ananda Kanda? Or is the mother herself, I, I had thought of that maybe, <coughs> herself, because of the universality and the way she saw her body as a sacrifice of the spirit, is, is she, in, in the yoga, would she be considered the Ananda Kanda? Well, that's interesting. Uh, that to me is an interesting process. I, I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, this is way beyond my my knowledge. Um, uh, I find this, the psychic being to really, really be fascinating. This, this, the dissertation was centered on uh, death and transformation, and I didn't really focus it on the psychic being. Uh, and I think it's really worthwhile. I mean, I understand that there are maybe two centers. There's one over on the right. Mm -hmm. There's also the idea that there's a 
physical. Actually, I, I mean, I can answer this. It's not going to answer your question, but I, I can well, show. I'm just asking if you came upon it or what you thought. You know. No, but I, I, I'll show this. It, I'm, it's really going to be an inadequate job because what you're talking about isn't just in terms of the, um, the teachings from either Hinduism or the teachings from alchemy. Right. Um, but I want to show you this. I actually pre prepared this as uh, just in case. <laughs> but it's it's all sim it's all symbol it's all symbol. Yeah, yeah, right. But I just want to point this out, and I was going to bring an apple, but and I'll I'll show you. This. <laughs> but I didn't have one. But I'll show I'll, I'll just show you this. That if you look at this image of Adam and Eve, right, you see that they're both holding apples. Eve is holding this apple next to her breast, right. This the serpent is looking at Eve. Adam is holding his down by his genitals, and he's even pointing. He's kind of in a kind of a way. He's showing you there's a secret that's. In if you look at this picture, um, you see Eve is taking the apple right at the point that Adam is uh, holding, is, is touching the mother's breast, uh, touching yeah, Eve's breast. And over here, Eve is, is holding an apple very close to her breast. Now, unless you think that this is just my, uh, my fixation on breasts, <laughs> you see here in these Renaissance paintings that the breast is often depicted as this very round form in both of these. And here, where the breast would be and the baby would be suckling, you see that the Christ child is actually holding an apple. So the apple is related. Now that's amazing. So the apple is related to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's our, it's our carnal form, right? But it gets even better. In this picture, in this picture, you see the mother, the divine mother, the Madonna, is holding the apple in front of the son's body, right where his heart would be. And you see these little leaves coming off of it here, and. This is the, the sacred heart. It's the sacred heart of Jesus. And the sacred heart that has the thorns around it and the flame of spirit is both carnal and spiritual. It's the union of spirit and matter within the heart of the individual. Now, um, do, do I have another one? Oh, yeah. And it's just to point out that the tree then transforms into the, the cross, right? The holy root. Jesus has the fruit of that tree. Jesus has the symbol of the union of heaven and earth, right? Is the fruit. And so the, the sacred heart, which is in each one of us. Now, the best that I can say, and I really, it's like really a poor <coughs> way of explaining this, is that it doesn't really matter where that center is. Like I said, some, some people put the center here in the Brahma Grandra. The mother worked in the cells. She said, in every single cell of the body, there is a mind. And she wanted to contact that mind because she's, it needed to be convinced that it didn't have to die. That, because every single thing that exists has this belief that it must die. So the center is, as Jung put it, and I, I can't remember the source of this, it's, uh, you know, that the, the divine God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. And I really think that that's the only answer that I can give, because in any of the experiences that I would call spiritual that I've had, there's no up or down, there's no in or out. Um, and it's just that all I can do to just hold on to the images that flow back in when I re-enter. So, um, that's, like I said, it's the best that I can do from my limited perspective. But I think it's a fascinating subject. An entire treatise on the, the psychic being could be written really doing this kind of research. I mean, I literally spent eight hours a day, Roche can attest to this, eight hours a day, six to seven days a week for, for over two years. Every single day, this was, I'd wake up in the morning and I'd immediately start. One of Roche's professors um, pointed out, she said, you know, your dissertation is your mistress. Don't marry it. <laughs> and she said, and at the end of this, you're going to have to put her aside. And I don't know, it's really hard to separate from her. <laughs> so, again, I'm not answering any of your questions, but somewhere in there. Uh, yeah, so let, can we open it up to yeah, the okay. audience? Okay. I have a spiritual question. Um, what is known, what do you know about the mother and sure of being? I know, I know nothing. However, Hillary in her dissertation, and Hillary has spoken to me about this, and I find it really fascinating that they, that they may very well have at least practiced uh, tantric sex, but there's no proof of it. And the mother, in everything that I've read by her, says to basically says to the disciples, if you're going to be here at the ashram practicing with us, then no sex. This, you have to be celibate here. 
And when the disciples say, but, you know, can I, you know, can I, she says, what is it about no sex that you don't understand? <laughs> However, other disciples would come that live in the world, and she would say, if the urge is within you, then you follow that. But the supermental yoga is going to require celibacy. This may be something that they came to later. I see no, no reason why they couldn't have actually gone through this. And the mother, when she talks about Sri Aurobindo, is very clear that she loved him. And you can feel that love. When she, she even says the first time that they met, she experienced her head resting on his shoulder. Whether it actually happened or not, she said she couldn't even remember. Mm. So I think that there was an extraordinarily deep love there. And they might very well have explored this. And they, it, there may have been, if they explored it, there may have been that more carnal element to it also. But I have absolutely no idea. Um, there, you know, integral means to incorporate everything. So I, I don't doubt it, but I don't know. And I wouldn't presume to say, well, But more power to them. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to comment in appreciation one of the many things that you brought forth towards the end somewhere. Uh, I was, it was uh, unfortunately Jorge boogied from the room before you brought this up, but you know Jorge has concerns about the perennial philosophy, and I think that the way you presented it show. Uh, the resolution of that, the, the deep reality of the oneness, but without uh, denigrating any of the manifold forms in which it can be expressed. I think you, the integral, in its best, um, at its best, is <coughs> both poles, both that the kind of perennial unity and also the the, the, the many. Right, and that would be that would correspond. I mean, I, I think integral. May, may be the, the best single representation of the new paradigm that we're moving into. Um, and it, uh, and, and what, the change in functional dynamic from the old paradigm, which is either or, is to the, the new functional dynamic of both and, so that you can hold those opposites without conflict, which is what takes place in, in the absolute. There's no problem about male and female, or one and many, all of those exist simultaneously without conflict at that level, and moving into the, the integral paradigm gives us a, a door, an opening to, to begin to comprehend that. Yeah, I was, I was very fortunate to have been raised a Unitarian, <laughs> and uh, Unitarians kind of have this covered also in the West, so I, I have a kind of an integral mindset just from my upbringing, gotcha. and also from, from working for 20 years plus with Rudolf Steiner's work, which is also very integral. Way that it attempts to incorporate all of these things. Stephen Hillary does have one other follow up. I just have a quick, because it has to do with our modern world, which is major right now, and the mother with the whole embodiment process, and she ever been to my mother really uh, saying that, you know, death would be negated eventually, right? Interesting to me that we're having the stem cell research that's going on that is really replacing limbs and all sorts of things around the world. We, we don't have a lot here, but around the world is being done hugely. And I'm wondering what that might mean. Stem cell research might really mean something to do with the resurrection of these parts of the body. It's, it's a very interesting process because we're, we're living in a scientific time when maybe some of this integralism that we've been adoring for so many years is coming to flower in, in, a, in a more scientific way. The mother was, uh, actually had a lot of faith in science early on. Later on, she became a little bit more critical, but she felt that science might actually be the, the path that's taken to this. Um, Sri Aurobindo said that in his sayings. One of, one of the things that ended my particular work on him was that science will one day find a way. That's interesting. So I, I'm thinking this stem cell may be a way in which some of this, just tiny bits, are coming through. But if we, it's not strictly about physical immortality. No. It's about the union of spirit and matter. So if we have physical immortality and just become despots, then that's a horror that's in, in terms of the universe. You know, that we would just survive and then spread out into the universe, destroying everything in our way. I mean, can you imagine, maybe you'll forgive me, Dick Cheney living, you know, 10,000 years. <laughs> We'd be in real trouble. Okay. Well, I think that's part of the mystery. I don't think it's going to be... <laughs> Well, if, if, if we undergo a transformation like that, maybe the, the inner transformation actually takes place. 
I don't know. But it is fascinating, the work. And there are some, some people, what are they called, transhumanists. And I don't really talk about them in the dissertation, but they, you know, they have this idea that we can actually attain physical immortality within a generation. So that's interesting. Ray Kurzweil does that. Ray Kurzweil. Mm -hmm. It's interesting stuff. I um, noticed over my lifetime that, at least anecdotically, that there seem to be more children being born with their eyes open and more clarity of sight. Hmm. And I was wondering if, um, uh, and, and I remember when I first started meditating back in 73, the careers that people would go through and then that has subsided. And I attribute that to uh, uh, raising the general vibration of, of, of humans. And, and um, so I, it, it occurred to me that maybe this activity may not have manifested, I mean, the efforts that the mother has made and Sri Aurobindo's made and others have made might not quite show up in the way that they had anticipated. But there might be more and more beings manifesting that don't see any barrier between Bardo 1, 2, and 3, and 4. And, you know, they, they just live the cycle with uh, uh, adopting and, and, if you will, dropping a body. Yeah, the mother said that she wasn't sure what, nobody really knew what the supermental being would look like once it formed. We might not even recognize it. Um, I, I just want to say on the first point of open eyes, when my daughter was born, she, her head popped out first, and she opened her eyes and looked right into my eyes. Uh, and then she closed them and went right back into her mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> um, uh, but I, I also feel that, I mean, it's just really interesting. Now, whether the mother actually affected this change or whether she was plugged in at, at another level, I, I'm not qualified to, to speak about. But she said back in 1956, when she broke through the golden door, and the supermental began to descend, that we would see huge changes worldwide, and then this 1960s happened. And right in the center of all of that, 1969, she said that's when the supermental manifestation took place and took root in the earth. And that she said that you will see tremendous changes over the next generation, but they're not all going to be good, because these are the death throes of the old and the, re and the birth of the new. <coughs> now, again, she may have just kind of intuited, seeing, kind of looking at what would happen. Jung, at the end of his life, according to von Franz, and in his notebook wrote uh, this red graph line like this, and then wrote underneath it the last 50 years of humanity. And von Franz was horrified by that. So Jung may have actually been very pessimistic about our possibilities. Um, yeah, I don't know. I go, like I said, I just go back and forth with this all the time. I'm, I'm, I, I was told that I'm, uh, what's the term? I'm, I tend to kind of like, whichever energy is in the room, that's the one I align with. I'm a minor. <laughs> so I swing back and forth. And come from there. <laughs> um, have there been any, because this is, topic's very new to me, I've been reading since your little blurb came out that you were going to present your dissertation with this, so I've been doing a little reading about the topic. Is there anything uh, that anyone has identified uh, a new incarnation of the mother since her physical passing? Since you showed a photo of the person that she felt was a, you know, an incarnation for I, Yeah, I mentioned very briefly Norelli Bachelet, who I believe felt that the, in the way that she, when Sri Aurobindo died, the mother said that his kind of psychic being, his psychic energy entered her body. Yes. So Norelli Bachelet said that the mother did this with her. And okay. It's extraordinarily controversial in the community, and I have no opinion on the matter. But she also said that her son was Sri Aurobindo reborn. Uh, and what I understand is that there are, he has pro he personally has problems with that. So I don't I don't really know. But you know when you when you live in this consciousness, it's sometimes really difficult to kind of separate out the physical reality from the symbolic reality. But I have I haven't heard of anybody claiming that the mother has come back. And I don't know that she I, in the entire agenda. I don't think that she says it once that she's coming back. To her, she as the as the principle of imminence. I think it's it's for her to you know to go through this process of becoming the universe again. Whereas Sri Aurobindo, as the principle of transcendence, is the one that in Christianity the divine father enters into the mother's womb and then becomes the divine child. So he's the one that will be reborn. But it's not Arvind Ghosh that's going to be reborn. 
the psychic being that is um, the Lord. The mother always called him the Lord because she saw him as an incarnation of this of this energy. Yeah. Well, there is this. Uh, there is a, a mother in Germany now uh, who was for a while followed by Andrew Harvey, um, who claimed that she was the reincarnation of Mother Mira. She was an Indian woman, and she went to the ashram. And of course, they said, well, sorry, we only have one Mother Mira. <laughs> you know? uh, and that was it. I mean, by tradition at the ashram, they always felt that, the, that these were two unique beings, and there's not going to be uh, new avatars that are reincarnated. <coughs> I mean, I think that's the a general understanding of the community. You know, I think we have to stop for now. Uh, are you, Jim, are you okay that we... Okay. Um, can we uh, share a couple of things that we talked about in, the, uh, in our little conference? Um, you know, one thing that... This is not about the dissertation summer stuff, and it's about your presentation. And, you know, you clearly are the professor of this material. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you will teach it, because yeah. I would say every one of your slides is an hour lecture. I mean, it was mm -hmm. hard to go through these slides, right? Yeah. Uh, like in, in that brief time, because I think you were prepared and ready to talk about each one in depth, and it was very clear. So part of the thing, part of becoming a PhD is that you really are now in the academy and you are doctus, which in the Latin word means you're learned. And so I want to say the committee not only unanimously agrees that you should receive the PhD, but that there are no changes required in your dissertation. <laughs> so happy that you brought me here that I'm going to send you the bills for my... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the other thing is that uh, thank you for saying no more changes are needed, but what if I, what if I decide that? Say it again, This is exactly why we're not allowed to no, yeah. <laughs> It's a condition of your getting your life. <laughs> Thanks so. I bet Roche it's likes to hear that. <laughs> we don't want it to take another year. <laughs> so, um, so I do. Let so me just say that there's a kind of a formula that is used at these moments, and I want to say it, which is congratulations, doctor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Learner or Dr. Learner? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>